Mo friends, I have just finished this modern puma and want to put it on a simple scenic base. It's not going to be anything fancy. The main point of the scene will be showcasing the model and giving it some context. No intricate story or hidden message like we often see in dioramas, just a plain, simple, decorated display stand. So if you have some modern armor in your collection as well, you might give it a try, it's a lot of fun. Basically, giving the context to a modern tank in a very limited space is about using recognizable features that we can see all around us, but the first important step is creating the base itself. I like using styrofoam because I can cut it using a hot wire cutter into any size and shape, which is very important. It weighs pretty much nothing, so that's a huge plus as well. As you see, the model is gonna be the main event, and the scenery will just complement it, but that doesn't mean we can't fill the scene with interesting details. So yeah, the thing I said about using things from today's world, I built my Puma in an urban Panzer Ops configuration, or in other words, it's participating in urban combat training and has wooden pallets hanging on its sides as camouflage. A concrete panel road seemed like a good starting point, because it immediately gives you some basic hints. For example, that the tank isn't in a forest. It's also a great surface to work with, because it has tons of interesting textures. Cork is my favorite material for the job, because it's durable, doesn't react with enamel thinners, and when you stipulate with acrylic wood putty, the results are just incredible. The whole point is to use a thick layer of putty, and once it starts to solidify, smooth it out with something flat like a piece of plastic or a spatula. This will create that nice concrete texture. You can use as many layers as you want, depending on the texture you want to achieve, and the thicker the layer of putty is, the better it cracks. You see, the greatest benefit of cork is how you can bend it into all directions and it will create these awesome cracks in the putty. But you can also break it into pieces and it's gonna look absolutely amazing. Small pieces of the dry putty will fall off the surface during this process, adding to that exciting, gnarly texture of old, eroded concrete. It doesn't look very exciting now, but it's gonna be a pleasure to paint. Cork can be easily fixed in place with PVA glue, and if the slabs are slightly misplaced, it will add to the overall visual texture of the scene. It's also easy to match it with the size of the base. I trace the edges from the bottom, and then cut it to shape. This is also something that shouldn't be neglected in my opinion, because the overall presentation plays a major role as well. I also made these small curbs because I saw them in a stock photo, and Using references from the real world is one of the best ways to find interesting ideas. As for the terrain, there's not much of it. I added a bit of slope from each side so the scene wouldn't be a flat pancake. A similar raised panel road exists not far from where I live, so hey, realism, right? <laughs> but what about the groundwork itself? Well, my aim is to make it look like this cake. But... <laughs> It's not gonna be edible. Instead, I'll use Smart Mud from VMS, which has the same color and almost the same texture. It's my favorite terrain sculpting material because it's extremely soft, which makes it easy to create realistic impressions from tank tracks, soldiers' boots, and so on. And when it dries, it's rock hard and has this ceramic quality to it. It can be a bit hard to spread it over smooth styrofoam, but the drop of tap water will fix that issue. If you'd like to try this thing out yourself, you can buy it directly from VMS if you're in Europe, or Michigan Toy Soldier Company if you're in the US. I have discount codes for you and the links are in the video description, so check them out if you're interested. So now we have the basic outline of the scene finished, and when I was speaking about the overall presentation, this next step is closely related to it. Every diorama looks great when it has clean, smooth sides. Sure, there are some approaches where you can make it look like a core sample taken directly from Earth, but when we get down to personal preferences, I like it when the sides are covered with oak veneer, because it's clean, smooth, yet has some minute wood grain texture. So it's not too smooth, like, let's say, sheets of styrene. It's not a tedious job, but it takes some time to get it right. 
Double-sided tape speeds things up a bit because it creates an instant bond and you don't have to wait for it to cure, as is the case with wood glue for example. I always try to remove as much excess material as possible beforehand using scissors, but the final cuts have to be made when everything is in place. A sharp hobby blade is essential for this of course, but the seam wouldn't look so seamless without some additional blending. This is the biggest benefit of doing things in this exact order, because right now I can blend the concrete slabs with the veneer and fill any gaps using lightweight acrylic putty. The same thing is possible on the ground with VMS Smart Mud. Getting rid of these visible edges is a huge deal for me, because it nullifies that framed look of the diorama and enhances the feeling that the scenery continues way beyond the boundaries of the scene. All of this leads to the next stage in the ground building process, adding realistic textures with real earth from my garden. Trademark. But the awesomeness of this stuff doesn't end here, because I also used it to fill the gaps between concrete slabs. But I was also able to try some prototype real earth from VMS, and if everything goes smoothly, it should be coming out soon, opening up more possibilities for modelers. The earth can be moved around with a paintbrush, and this isn't usually needed on regular groundwork, but it helps to make the effect more controllable on the concrete. But how are we going to fix it in place? Well, it's quite simple. First, we need to break the surface tension by soaking everything with isopropyl alcohol. I don't have any at hand, so I used Mr. Leveling Thinner, but the effect remains the same. The ground becomes saturated and it'll nicely absorb diluted PVA glue. It's a quick process, but we have to be careful. If the glue accidentally runs down the wooden sides, it'll saturate the veneer and it'll cause problems with wood stain. However, it's not an issue if you like to paint the sides black. Okay, so here's our simple piece of groundwork and it's just about time to start adding some more interesting details. Once again, something that's common and easy to recognize, such as a piece of chain link fence. I bought several of these when I was younger, and it's the first time I found some good use for them, or at least one of them. Now, another cool thing about the fence is that you're able to observe the model through it, and that's a huge deal if you want the model to be observed from all sides. Initially, I considered a small corner of an old building for this vignette, because it would enhance the urban combat atmosphere, but it would completely hide a huge portion of the model, and that's something I wanted to avoid. It's a simple detail, but it adds quite a few plus points to our scene. And while we are at it, urban environments often have a lot of junk lying around. I didn't want to clutter the scene too much, but a couple of plastic barrels are gonna be another detail that enhances the look of this scene. It looks really nice and we can immediately tear it down because there's one more important thing, adding vegetation in the form of static grass. I like to use several lengths and work in small patches for a more random, natural look. Brushing the entire area with a thick layer of glue might be faster, but I think it's better to take your time and build the effect up slowly. A static grass applicator is an amazing tool for this job, and you don't have to be a railroad modeler to appreciate the benefits of owning one. It made my life so much easier even though I only create military dioramas which are relatively small compared to railroad sceneries. But even this tool has its limits, or maybe it's just my lack of skill with it, but from my experience, it will only get you so far. Longer stalks will have a hard time falling through the metal mesh of the applicator, and I found that planting them manually with tweezers leads to far more authentic results. So basically, I start with the basic layout created with the applicator and then add volume to the largest patches with bigger grass, planted manually. The image that I used as inspiration for the panel road has different types of grass on each side, dry and small on the right, vivid and tall on the left, so I tried to do something similar, although the colors are not important right now. But now that I mention colors, it's finally time to start painting everything. Wood stain is a matter of personal taste. I liked painting the sides with a flat black color for the longest time, but this year I started to enjoy this dark wooden finish because it makes the whole thing more 
pleasant to look at. And because we're about to start airbrushing everything, the wooden sides have to be protected with masking tape. Luckily, it can be cut precisely with the hobby blade. It's basically the same thing as cutting the veneer, but easier because, well, you know, it's just tape. <laughs> Everything has to be covered in a thick coat of dark brown primer. We have a lot of different and sometimes quite exotic materials here, and giving them a smooth, uniform, dark surface is essential for painting and post shading. The thick coverage will also saturate some of the porous materials such as the cork and earth, making them easier to paint with brushes. When it comes to airbrushing, I always start with grass because there's a lot of overspray that's easy to fix once I spray the earth. There are two types of grass at play, as I mentioned, dry and vivid. I have my standard recipes for both of these and for dry tones, I like dark yellow from Tamiya the most. But because we're using the post shading method, a single color won't cut it. Buff is very good for highlights, but for example adding white to dark yellow also works pretty well. Fresh grass can be painted in several different ways. We can make it look really vivid with yellow, or dusty and less saturated if we use buff. I tried various types of green over the years and the results are usually very similar no matter which tone I choose. What's really important are the highlights. For this scene, I chose pure yellow green, which is an awesome color and strikes a good balance between that extremely vivid look and the more muted, dusty appearance. What's most important is painting the grass with very light colors, because the subsequent steps will make it slightly darker. Next up is concrete, and here a single coat of deck tan will suffice for now. The dark brown primer helps big time because all the subtle textures and deep cracks pop out like crazy. And finally, flat earth. It's just the most basic form of base coat for now, and I'm using it mainly to fix the crazy overspray from static grass. We're not gonna need the masking tape after this point, so I don't see any reason to keep it in place. In fact, exposing the veneer will tell us how the wooden sides work with the color palette of the scenery, and if needed, we can adjust the balance by adding another layer of wood stain, or slightly changing the color of the groundwork with brushes. But it doesn't look so bad, even though it's just airbrushed, right? Well, we're about to make it look much better. Let's start with the concrete, because it's so easy, yet the results are absolutely mind-blowing. You'll only need three colors for it, and the first two steps can be done with your eyes shut. We need to start with two thick acrylic washes. Graphite is a nice medium gray color with a warm hue, and it'll enhance the airbrushed base coat. While it's still wet, I apply a wash from Burnt Umber, focusing it around cracks and pits in the concrete. It'll outline all the textures and create a nice, dirty surface. And finally, deck tan for the highlights. This is the only time-consuming step in the process because it involves picking out the individual sections between cracks and highlighting every raised portion on the surface. Note that there was only one grey paint used in the entire process. Concrete is usually grey, right? But the majority of colors were brown and sand colored. A dark brown primer, deck tan for the base coat, graphite as the second base coat, another dark brown for the wash, and once again, deck tan for the highlights. Just three simple steps with a paintbrush, and the slabs are exploding with texture and visual candy. But we're not done with them. Before I switch to enamel earth effects, I wanted to add more dirt and leaf scatter. After all, the puma is very muddy, and the concrete needs to be weathered similarly, otherwise the model would look completely out of place. All of this mess was held in place with gravel and sand fixer because it's alcohol based, so I don't need to soak the groundwork again. When it dried, I gave earthing a subtle pre-dusting with buff. It's the same color I used on the model, and the first step in the process of blending the tank and the ground together. And now for enamels. This is a huge benefit of cork, because if I made the concrete from styrofoam, it would start melting at this point. Acrylic paints are awesome and you can create pretty much any effect with them, but there's something about enamels, like how they flow, how they can be blended, it's just great working with them. 
But again, I'm also visually tying the ground to the model and using the same enamel earth effects as I used on the Puma. I enjoy working with AK products a lot, so it was a real privilege when I was able to team up with them earlier this year. Because of that, if you like buying through their store, you can use my affiliate link in the video description and help me out if you purchase something. And as a small bonus, I'm giving you a discount code. And you'll find all of that down below. Anyway, this is also the only time I placed the Puma on the ground to see how it's gonna look. And where should I add more mud to make it all work together? So that's the groundwork finished, my friends. It wasn't difficult at all, and it's a nice piece of land that will showcase the model. Let's now finish those small details and make it even more appealing. The chain link fence was base coated with a mixture of flat brown and flat yellow as a solid rust color. All of the weathering was carried out using acrylics and most of the time it was done with sponges. Old fences usually have a very dark, rusty surface, but I wanted to give it more texture. The metal poles are the only part where I used a paintbrush to connect some of those random grey patches. And it's been a while since I used the awesome rust set from Life Color. To this day, it's got to be my favorite when it comes to heavy corrosion, because the paints dry to an extremely flat finish, and the tones they mixed for this set are spot on. I think the sponge method is ideal for the job, because the fence doesn't have a lot of surface to work with. Of course, except the poles again, where I used very diluted rust glazes to tie everything together. However, things don't always work so smoothly, and once I glued the fence in place, it just didn't fit the color palette of the scene. So I had to play around a little and add some of those enamel earth effects to visually tie these elements together. I also found it a bit dark, even though that's how it should look, but I was worried it would completely disappear in the background, so I gave it some more of that grayish steel texture. The plastic barrels were really fun, because they are something I haven't painted so far. Fresh and new things are always fun, and I enjoyed them even more when I learned that they don't need too many weathering effects. Just a pale, sun-bleached base color, some quick painting on those black lids, a pin wash to outline every detail and for those subtle dirt accumulations. And they were ready to be glued into the diorama. I also knew that some final adjustments would be needed here, and that it's better to perform them when they're already a part of the scene, but the only thing that I added was moss. This is such a cool detail that I added it in other places as well, and for the first time I used these pre-made patches of moss from AK, made from extremely thin static grass. They look quite good on their own, but integration with paints is essential, no matter what type of detail we're dealing with. A quick wash with slimy grime, both dark and light, and they were ready to go. As I was nearing the finish line, I felt like situating the scene in early autumn would be the best choice, because I could maximize the amount of surface details on the ground. Paper leaves from AK were glued individually using tweezers and blended with heavy rust washes. Yes, I know, I should buy more of them, because so far I've been only using oak leaves in every diorama, but I'll get there. Paper vegetation is actually my final touch in any diorama, because with every other element finished, it's easier to evaluate the scene and spot places that could be improved with these details. Even though all of these plants are made from green paper, I like to base coat them with a mixture of black and brown, because it allows me to post shade them just like everything else in the diorama. It also creates a nice artificial shadow in those areas that are out of sight, making them look more three-dimensional. Also, I like to paint them in rich, vivid tones, aka golden olive and frog green, which adds a nice contrast to the whole scenery. Small plants and weeds always stay fresh even when the trees and grass are starting to check out in the autumn, but a couple of subtle rust washes won't hurt. It's just sad that this peaceful corner of nature is gonna sit directly behind the model, but we can always turn the scene around and observe everything from behind. 
Anyway, my friends, simple bases are fun and I like working on them even more than on large dioramas because they invite you to add as many small details and creative decisions in the limited space as possible. This video is a part of the Puma series because I made it for that model, but I decided to present it as a loose guide or inspiration for anyone who likes building modern armor and would like to add some kind of simple base for one of their models. Of course, bigger dioramas tell a better story and give us more context, but I think the story can be told even in small area with a few important details that help us imagine the bigger picture, and by that I mean the landscape beyond the boundaries of the scene. Most of the exciting textures are hidden under the model, but uh, that's okay, it's a part of the deal when you're making small sceneries. I hope you liked the result and let me know if you're going to try something similar. If you want to make nice concrete, Cork is definitely the way to go. The moment you try it, you will be hooked. <laughs> I worked extra hard on this one because I knew it would be possible to finish it in less than a week and give you two videos in a row, so yeah, I'm very happy with that as well. Anyway, next up we're going back to World War II and the model is not going to be a tank. And it's gonna be a part of a pretty flashy diorama, but it'll be a lot of work. In the meantime, I want to sincerely thank every single one of you for watching these videos, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be sitting here building models for a living. And I can't thank you enough for this amazing opportunity. All of this is also possible thanks to my incredible patrons. My whole Patreon page is like a Night Shift magazine subscription, as I post there almost every day with updates from my workbench, and actually sometimes it's multiple times a day when I'm extra productive. We can also get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos and those stay there forever so you can always go back to them without even keeping track of these official uploads on my channel. I also have some extra goodies such as 3D models which you can download and print for your own projects, a bunch of real life references for nature, old buildings and so on. And last but not least, these higher resolution studio photos which show the model in more detail than video ever could. It would help me a lot, but hey, no pressure. Anyway, my friends, this scene and video brought me back to last year when I was working extra hard to bring you videos every single week. And although I'm much happier with my new irregular upload schedule, I always want to bring you new videos as often as possible, so I'm really happy that I could finish this one in time. Now I need to go and clean my studio because it looks like a hobby store exploded in there and you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!